Hello, you're watching Foreign Correspondents. I'm Min Sun Hee with our panel of foreign journalists. Welcome to the show. Good to be back, thanks. It's been an eventful week. What were some of the stories that caught your attention? We'll start with you, Eva. I think we all looked at this uh, missile um, test and um, I think it was not so much of a surprise that there would be a missile shot, uh, a missile shot uh, on 4th of July, but it was a surprise that it would be ICBM and that it would be presumably successful. Right. Elise, what about you? Same. I mean, this ICBM test crosses a real psychological threshold. I mean, we've watched North Korea get advancing or increase its sort of uh, technological capabilities now for years. And uh, but this one is the one that could possibly reach and threaten the United States, um, at least the state of Alaska, theoretically. So um, it's a big psychological threshold to have broken. Frank. Obviously, I was looking at the same story as well. What I what I thought was particularly interesting about about this was that we saw video of Kim Jong Un right at the missile site, right beside the missile as it was being prepared. So I think this more firmly connects Kim Jong Un to the development of of missile and nuclear technology in North Korea. Right. Well, prior to that missile launch, President Moon Jae-in and his U.S. counterpart Donald Trump met late last month. Observers stand divided with regard to the results of that summit, with uh, some claiming it was a favorable encounter and others pointing to the lack of substantial talks. We have details in this report. On June 29th, U.S. time, the first Korea-U.S. summit was held. The summit garnered much attention since it was the first meeting between the two leaders since the launch of the new administrations. President Moon's visit to the White House was an official working visit. However, US President Donald Trump called it a state visit, extending much honor to President Moon. A lot of people didn't expect that, and I did expect it. I thought that was going to happen, so I want to congratulate you very much. And thank you also. Thank you for coming. Thank you very much. A full-scale Korea-U.S. summit meeting was held on the 30th for an hour and 10 minutes. Through the joint declaration shortly after the summit, the two leaders announced that they would prioritize resolving North Korea's nuclear issue and closely coordinate related policies. President Trump also caused some controversy over the issue of renegotiation of the Korea-US FTA, which was not agreed upon during the summit. Our trade deficit with South Korea has increased by more than $11 billion. Not exactly a great deal. But even with this controversy, the Korea government has filled the gap in diplomatic ties with the talks and has asserted that Korea has taken the lead in the issues surrounding the Korean Peninsula. However, on July 4th, the favorable atmosphere surrounding the Korea-U.S. summit was met with a cold spell. North Korea launched an intercontinental ballistic missile. The U.S. government, which had confirmed that the missile launched by North Korea was an intercontinental ballistic missile, strongly stated that they will not accept a nuclear North Korea. Eventually, through President Moon Jae-in's orders on July 5th, the Korea-U.S. guided missile unit launched drills in protest to North Korea's latest provocation. The positive atmosphere surrounding the Korea-U.S. summit was overshadowed by North Korea's hostile activities. And in this edition of Foreign Correspondence, we delve into this matter. Let's begin with how you would assess the Korea-U.S. summit. Which country, if I may, gained from the talks ever, in your opinion? 
Well, I think it was a win-win, really. All observers would say that uh, it went well, uh, considering the, the differences between the two leaders. But if I had to answer, and if I had to choose, I might say Moon Jae-in was the one who had the most risks. It's always tricky, I believe, when we meet Donald Trump, and there's always the risk that something will go wrong, and I think he played it really well. Elise is an American journalist, in your opinion, which country gained from the latest talks? Well, a lot of um, U.S. embassy sources will actually talk about how this meeting was premature in that uh, Trump isn't really staffed up yet, that Moon was just elected in May, um, so that this meeting was really about just a face-to-face, -face, kind of getting to know each other, and um, really for the South Koreans' benefit, not really for the United States' benefit, because the United States' uh, position has remained the same, that they, and it wasn't really looking for any sort of substantive outcome. And so, so long as you know South Koreans felt like uh, assured and reassured about the alliance, then, you know, everything continues apace. I agree with uh, Ava a, a little bit that Moon might have come out of this uh, a little bit ahead, given that when we look at the um, joint statement, the real contentious issues for South Korea, like the Chorus Free Trade Agreement, was, was left out of it primarily. But I think to really evaluate this agreement, we need to to wait a little while, given what, what North Korea did launching an ICBM just a few days after the summit. And so that really changes, I think, the dynamic of the main other aspect of, of Moon's gain in the summit, which was that he can pursue engagement and dialogue with North Korea with a little bit of support from the United States. So looking at, at those two things, we need to, to wait a little bit. Uh, prior to his meeting with President Moon Jae-in, President Trump also had talks with uh, Japanese Prime Minister Shinzo Abe, Chinese leader uh, Xi Jinping, as well as British Prime Minister Theresa May. If I were to ask you for a difference, perhaps, in his interactions with these other leaders and that with President Moon Jae-in, what would you point to ever? I think we always look at details when there are those kind of bilateral summits. We remember he, uh, Donald Trump played golf with uh, Shinzo Abe and uh, Trump and Xi Jinping eating steak together. Here they ate uh, bibimbap. Um, I think all the signs showed that um, it was going well. Now, coming back to the example of the meeting with Xi Jinping, um, back at that time, I, I believe it was in April, everybody said it was a great meeting, it was going well. Donald Trump said it was great, great meeting. But now we see that it's tensed again between the States and, and China with that um, arm sales deal, uh, with North Korea issue back. So I don't think we can put too much emphasis on, on those details that happened during the summit. Yeah, I, can, I completely agree with Eva here. I think that, again, evaluating the, the success or failure of the summit might take some time uh, after the summit. In addition, there are some intractable issues between the two countries that they're not going to be able to iron out at a summit. They'll just have to kind of agree to disagree. And I think we saw similar things between the Xi Jinping summit and, and the Moon Jae-in summit. Okay, well, keeping all that in mind then, Elise, out of a score of 100, what would you award the Korea-U.S. summit? That's a difficult question since I don't know the rubric that we're grading from, you know? So if I'm going to uh, grade it by appearances, like did they uh, make any major gaffes? No. Um, did they have any major disagreements that then caused a lot of drama? No. And then we have to remember that this Moon-Trump summit happened in a context um, of the United States being really gripped by a media fight between Trump and a television news anchor in the US. And so it almost got, it got really downplayed and not played very much at all. So to the extent that, is it in, it, was it an important summit with a partner in Asia that should have gotten more attention, then I mean, I would give it a D or a C, you know, because it didn't play, right? It's not something that Americans learned about or cared about or paid more attention to. Um, to the extent that the appearances were good and everything came out pretty smoothly without major disagreements, I guess I would give that like a B plus, A minus. Um, there was a little bit of disagreement about the free trade um, uh, or the chorus conversation about the um, Korea-U.S. trade agreement. So uh, that you know, I would dock a few points for that. But overall, this did not play very big in the U.S. And to the extent that this show is about how um, some of these play in the media, I would say um, this got very buried.
Well, one issue that did get attention, though, coverage, was the two leaders' agreement to use dialogue and negotiations to resolve North Korea's nuclear ambitions. Uh, given the later circumstances, the launch of the intercontinental ballistic missile, do you suppose dialogue ever is a viable option? Well, if I remember the, the sentence correctly from the meeting, it was the door to, the, to dialogue uh, is still open under the right circumstances. Uh, when I saw that sentence before the missile test, um, I thought we will have to define, Trump and Moon will have to define what, is the right, what are the right circumstances, and they might not have the same answers. Uh, now, after the ICBM test, um, I think we could all agree, uh, even Moon, that those are not the right circumstances for dialogue, and I think um, dialogue won't happen in the next future, in the short term. It will have to wait, and first, I'm pretty sure we will see um, increased pressure maybe increased sanctions, maybe secondary sanctions. Uh, and with the dialogue in mind still, the, the dialogue remains a goal for Moon, uh, but that will only come later. And whether Trump or not will um, still agree to open up for dialogue is, uh, remains to be seen. I have a question of, uh, about that, actually. Moon met with reporters, and, and he was asked by, I think, a, a Korean journalist, you know, what are the conditions then? That, that would open up uh, the path toward dialogue. So my question for you guys is, what do you think the conditions are for dialogue? What, what would North Korea have to do in order to enable dialogue with South Korea and the United States? Well, this would assume that there hasn't been dialogue going on. There has been dialogue going on between North Korea and the United States, especially like on the back channels. And those have been happening um, at, to try and get to more formal sort of uh, head of state or leader, you know, f more official track one, if you will, talks. Um, I think one of the problems hasn't been that, uh, that South Korea or the U.S. hasn't been willing to engage. It's that North Korea hasn't been willing to engage. They're calling for a peace treaty, right? And, and that's a far ask. That's a very far away from where things are at right now, which makes things very difficult. But arguably, what the ICBM test does is it makes the position, the negotiating position for the US, Japan, and South Korea, and everyone else far worse. And so North Korea is at an advantage. They have more leverage right now. I think I agree. I think North Korea on the principle um, is ready to dialogue or is willing to open a dialogue, but they felt that they, they were not in a bargaining position and therefore the ICBM test puts them now in a better bargaining position, uh, but now the other side can't can't accept the dialogue right now. I think that's one of the problems with this dynamic. As, as North Korea gets closer to having a, a fully fledged uh, nuclear weapons capability to strike the United States, its hand in negotiations is getting stronger. At the same time, the willingness of the US and South Korea to give up something to get to the negotiating table seems to be decreasing. As, as, you know, ironically, Washington and Seoul's hand in that negotiations, should they take place, is weakening. So with that dynamic, I, I think you're going to see North Korea continue to get as close to it as it can, if not fully develop a, a missile capability to strike the United States with a nuclear weapon. And stop preventing that from happening, really South Korea and the United States are, are going to have to give up something to, to get them to the negotiating table to, you know, at least lengthen the so-called breakout period if they can get a freeze on North Korea's nuclear and missile developments. Now, a day after the missile launch, uh, forces here in South Korea, including, of course, American military officials, conducted a joint drill. Uh, this um, display of might, so to speak, how effective is it in deterring North Korea, do you think, Eva? I think we haven't found uh, what works or what doesn't work with North Korea, and that's the whole problem with the North Korean issue, is that we never know what impact it will have, whether anything will have an impact, will change or not um, the, the leader's decision. And so this, the military exercises, I, I see them as just part of this cycle that, that we see every year when tensions arise and then missile tests and then answer and threats and the military exercises and then eventually it just softens and then sometimes dialogue reopens. I, I see, that, see that as the normal, regular path. Yeah, I, I totally agree. There's a status quo on the Korean Peninsula of this tension. 
And this tension and the division of the two Koreas really serves that status quo. There are reasons why China and Japan and the US uh, you know, favor this status quo, favor the tension in ways. It gives the US an excuse to have troops in this region in order to perhaps better contain China. It gives China an excuse to you know, continue with its development in the South China Sea, distracting attention away from that, giving it another chip in the negotiating table. Uh, Japan doesn't want to see a unified Korea with another sort of rival uh, in the region. So there are reasons why the status quo of tension uh, is supported in, in, by all parties. Do you foresee a change perhaps in the two-track policy then, the idea of using dialogue and sanctions at the same time, given the latest developments, Elise? I don't see a change in the short term, but there's a lot of just gut check conversations going on um, in Washington and in New York, the UN, to see uh, you know, if there are some options that are kind of out of the box or haven't been considered before. So that'll play out in the next couple of months or so. Uh, Elise, then, what are the chances of the Trump administration um, making a preemptive strike against North Korea, do you think? I think um, because of Defense Secretary James Mattis, who has really emerged as somebody who's been kind of a, a grown-up leader in the Trump administration, uh, that it's really unlikely that we're going to see a preemptive strike. Um, he has said that it would be, quote, catastrophic. Um, and the bloodbath that would occur just from artillery alone if North Korea were to retaliate against Seoul um, or South Korea anywhere. Right. Um, Frank, you talked about this earlier. Um, the Trump administration, well, President Trump, called for the renegotiation of the Korea-U.S. free trade agreement, claiming it was a rough arrangement for the U.S. Uh, what are the chances, do you think, Frank, of a renegotiation of the trade deal? Well, initially, prior to the summit, I didn't think that they were going to be able to get into it too much, and they didn't get into it too much. They managed to, you know, South Korea managed to keep it off the, the joint statement that was made, but Trump did mention it again in his news conference. In addition, uh, he talked to his trade representative to South Korea, uh, who informed uh, South Korea that they would be seeking a renegotiation of the, of the free trade agreement. So I see it uh, highly likely that the U.S. is at least going to try to reopen some aspects of that, particularly in terms of automobiles and steel. But, you know, I wonder if, if the U.S. would be successful in that. South Koreans are, are very patriotic, right? they're very nationalistic. You know, it's going to be tough to, to get South Koreans to buy more American cars. The other issues, they might have more success. Right. Now, in this next report, we take a look at President Moon's agenda in the United States. President Moon Jae-in's visit to the U.S. came just 51 days after his inauguration. During the three-night, five-day visit to the U.S., his schedule was packed with various events. President Moon Jae-in, who arrived in Washington, D.C. on the morning of June 28, U.S. time, began his schedule with an afternoon visit to Chang Jin-ho Battle Monument. The Chang Jin-ho Battle is one of the three major battles of the Korean War. Thanks to this battle, it was possible to carry out the Hunam evacuation, which transported 90,000 refugees. At that time, it was reported that President Moon's parents were also on the list of the refugees of the Hunam evacuation. Chang Jin-ho's soldiers were not there, and if the Hunam evacuation was not there, my life would not start again, and I would not be there today. President Moon then attended the Korea-U.S. Business Roundtable dinner and emphasized the benefits of bilateral trade. The first schedule on day two of President Moon's visit to the U.S. was a trip to the United States Congress. During the visit, President Moon sought to ease concerns about Korea negatively affecting the environment in an attempt to reserve the third deployment. On the morning of the 30th, President Moon paid tribute at the Korea War Veterans Memorial. Alongside U.S. Vice President Mike Pence, President Moon thanked all the war veterans for securing freedom and peace in South Korea. President Moon and First Lady Kim Jong-suk's final schedule was a meeting with Korean Americans. At a ceremony attended by more than 600 Korean Americans, President Moon mentioned the success of this visit. Trump 대통령으로부터 한반도의 평화 통일 환경 조성에서 대한민국의 주도적 역할과 
또 남북 대화 재개에 대한 지지를 확보한 것은 대단히 중요한 성과였다고 생각합니다. In light of President Moon Jae-in's hectic three-day, five-night visit to the U.S., it's worth wondering how this visit will promote ties between Korea and the U.S. Aside from his meeting with the U.S. leader, uh, what on President Moon's agenda was of interest to you as well, aside from that meeting as well? Well, I think he went and met the Congress, and I think, especially in the Trumps, uh, with Trump as a president, I think it's important that um, he makes friends with the Congress. So I think that was uh, an important part um, of the meeting. And then going to the Korean War Memorial uh, in Washington, D.C., I think was must have been emotional. Of course, it's mainly to take pictures and it's symbolic. Uh, but I've been there and I thought it was a very um, emotional um, moment and, and place. Um, so those would be the two events that I would right. yeah, pick up. It was up. quite poignant. Uh, Frank, what do you suppose his meeting with the veterans of war had? Well, I think that would, you know, uh, again, expose the United States and, and maybe emphasize his sort of you know, military, his own military history and military background, you know, he, he did serve uh, his military duty in, in South Korea, unlike uh, several previous presidents uh, here, and in outstanding fashion. In addition, the connection with his family, having been rescued essentially by American troops, some 3,000 troops died in, in the battle that really allowed his family to move from North Korea to South Korea and him to have a life. So that connection, I think, is, is important that Americans recognize that, perhaps. And, and it gives his other agenda a little bit more credibility, because he does have a, a softer line toward North Korea, and he does have kind of wants to see a shift in American policy. He's a liberal, which in South Korea traditionally has a little bit less uh, desire for a close alliance with the United States than conservatives here. Yet he has this special connection with the United States. So I think it does give, again, his other agendas toward North Korea a little bit of credibility. It is the economic delegation that accompanied President Moon uh, pledged to invest 35.2 billion US dollars within the next five years in the US. Such initiatives, what impact do you suppose they'll have on bilateral ties? Well, they are certainly um, following the playbook of Japan and China and doing the same thing because knowing that uh, Donald Trump is somebody who cares about, you know, investment or outside investment in the United States and he makes a big deal about it on, on Twitter, which is his main mode of communication directly with the people, um, I think that was a smart play, you know, um, even if those investments were already going to happen, which is in the, which is true for a lot of the Japanese ones, they were already going to invest anyway, but but uh, they sort of repackaged it and brought it, you know, with the bow on top to the United States because Trump sometimes isn't aware of the context. And so uh, this kind of looks good and it seems like it's a goodwill gesture, um, even though it, it tends to benefit both sides um, when there is more investment uh, uh, going both ways. I think it'd be curious to evaluate the value of those investments compared to the trade deficit and to see how much the U.S. is going to benefit from that. That'll create a lot of jobs in the United States, a $35 billion uh, investments in, in uh, factories there. But how does that balance the $11 billion a year in, in uh, a trade deficit? I think, it, again, it's a good strategy and, and follows up his strategy prior to the summit of being complementary toward Trump and playing down the differences uh, in their policies. Right. Uh, in the report we just saw, we also um, heard about uh, the First Lady Kim Jong-suk having a very busy schedule in the U.S. as well. What role do you suppose do First Ladies play during such summits, Eva? Well, I think during the summit, maybe the role is pretty limited. Now, um, I think First Ladies can um, actually get involved and actually do some things. I, I'm thinking about Michelle Obama, for example, who was very active, who might actually go into politics. Uh, people are expecting that she, that she is. Um, as far as Moon Jae-in's wife is concerned, I believe it was important because domestically, 
it was, uh, I think, a challenge for, for her to appear um, nice and serious and to make a good impression, not so much for the American side, but for the South Koreans who, who discover her. And uh, I think in that sense, it, it was important. And I think she, she, she did it. She did well. So she was in charge of the soft policy, so to speak. Um, if you had been assigned, Frank, to cover the summit between the Korean and American leaders, what would have been the title of your article? Handshakes all round. Mm -hmm. yeah, yeah, because uh, there were, you know, the handshakes of Donald Trump have been a really big issue. And I think that uh, it w there were some, some media reports about the handshakes between Donald Trump and Moon Jae-in, about they, had, they shook hands three times or something during uh, one of the events, and, and how Moon really kind of avoided uh, any problems around that. I, I mean, according to some people, it had a catastrophic effect on the, the Paris climate agreement with uh, Macron uh, with his handshake encouraging the U.S. to, to leave that, that deal. There was a, some type of report along those lines. So uh, that would be my title, Handshakes All Round. Right, okay. Well, uh, strengthening the Korea-U.S. alliance is what the two leaders hope to achieve. And we hope that that desire bears fruit under the two new administrations. Thank you for watching.